Check out what we've got here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool arcade repair video for you this evening. We have been messing around with this Atari hard driving arcade game that we picked up. And we've got it pretty much up and running. Everything's cool, but there's two little issues with it that I'm still messing with. So I figured we would film a video of us playing around with that. We never get these anymore. Um, they're, I don't know that they're rare, but I, they just never pop up really. This particular one doesn't have the side art, and it's been painted over. So we touched up the paint and uh, put new T-molding on it. The T-molding was all missing. And we've got it up and running, but we don't have it perfect yet. So the two things that aren't quite right is the steering works right, and everything's cool on it, but there's one, this one little test in the test menu that doesn't work right. So I'm going to check that out, see if I can figure that out. And then uh, the brake doesn't work. So the brake on this is this special type of uh, strain gauge brake that we'll talk about a little bit and we'll look at and see what we can figure out. So I figured I'd film a video and show it to you as we do it. This is the hard driving compact version. This thing is huge. And this is the small one. <laughs> right? So that's a Pac-Man over there next to it. Do you understand? Do you see what's going on here? If you, if you're some of our younger viewers, you well, you may have played this on the Genesis, but uh, I saw the other day we were we were working on this, and I was googling some stuff with the Googles, and I saw this game listed on a list of bad driving games. Sacrilegious people. That's horrible. This is not a bad driving game. It's an excellent driving game. It's very tough, and it may not be what you're used to, but this is an awesome game and has a lot of people that really like it. I'm not any good at it, by the way, but uh, we'll try it out here in a little bit. But the uh, um, a lot of people love this thing. This the, the, the draw of this game was that it was one of the first, at least. I won't say the first. Well, they say it's the first, so screw it. We'll say the first. The world's first driving simulation game. Realistic stick shift option. A stunt track with a 360 degree loop. Feedback steering and 3D graphics. The thing was way ahead of its time whenever it came out. And it was a lot like driving an actual car. So that was its whole thing. But, you know, you're driving a nice car on a stunt course and a race course and people loved it it was expensive though some some people said that, it, that they saw it uh, being operated for a dollar whenever it came out um, so maybe that was the cockpit version though the sit down one so there was a cockpit version and then there was this upright version that they called the compact because it's smaller than the, the cockpit um, and then there was a sequel called race driving that you really don't see too often. And then there was another one that was like a flight one, a flight simulator or something that used the same hardware. So I'm gonna show you all the hardware and everything. And then we're also going to uh, see if we can figure out the brake thing and the steering thing. Um, like I said, it plays good, but the brake doesn't work, which I don't use anyway. And the, uh, the steering works. I can't find anything wrong with it, but there's this one test that doesn't react the way that I think it's supposed to. So. We'll check that out. So let me take off the back door first and I'll show you what's inside of it. So this label is on the back door. Compact hard drive and self-test label. To keep the hard drive and simulator at peak efficiency and maximum earnings, you should use the self-test to check the RAMs, ROMs, PCBs, and microprocessor systems, controls, and coin options, game options, statistics, and histograms. Check these when you first set up the simulator each time you collect money or when the simulator is not functioning correctly and Joe's Video Games is trying to repair it. I'm going to add that in right there. Automated self-test. When you enter the self-test, the simulator automatically tests the program ROM and RAM, the GSP and the MSP microprocessor systems, the ADSP board, and the sound board. The check takes about five minutes. You can skip these tests by turning and holding the key switch. <laughs> if you want to go to the attract mode, just turn off the self-test switch. The first screen that appears 
uh, has information about the program RAM and ROM. The second screen that appears gives information about the ROM, RAM, microprocessor systems, and PCBs. If any of these if these are bad, see your hard drive and compact owner's manual. So it shows you all this stuff and how to go through all kinds of stuff, right? So we're going to do some of that. Now, uh, I should mention this. The monitor is up there. So it's mounted in the top of the cabinet. I don't have it turned on right now, but you can see it here in a minute. Whoop. It's mounted up in the top of the cabinet, facing down, and there is a mirror uh, that reflects it out to you. See that line right there? That is the edge of the mirror. So there is a mirror in there like that. The monitor is mounted up here facing down. Very cool. Also makes it very top heavy. So they're kind of hard to move. All right. So, looking inside, this is the back of the mon of the uh, mirror, right? There's this little wood shelf here. That's a transformer for the light bulb up in the top. Okay. So this is the back of the control panel. There's two speakers. Right, they're nice, big, heavy duty. They say realistic on them. I don't. I think those are original, but I don't know for sure. They're eight ohm speakers, and they say Thailand on them. That's the shifter. It's a four-way shifter, uh, old school Atari shifter. It's very similar to the one on pole position, but pole position is just a two-way. Uh, and then you have this big shaft here that comes down to this wheel which is attached with a belt to this motor. This motor has a big spring on it, right? So the purpose of all that is that motor uh, can shake the, the wheel. It's a force, well, I don't think it shakes it, it more pulls it. It's like a force feedback setup. This is the motor board that runs the motor. To Like if you pull left, it pulls to the right, you pull right, it pulls to the left. And remember, this is like 1989, I think. Hold on a second, let me see. It says it down here. Yes. 89-ish. So this is a very early force feedback setup. And they did it a little later, a little different later. Uh, standard switching power supply, so we've replaced this. This is new. Um, this maybe is an audio board. If I was going to guess, I'd say that's an audio board. Uh, big transformer here for different things. There's some fuses down here. Uh, a line filter. And then the game board are these, it's this big three board set here. Very large. So this board here goes down way past these all the way down to the bottom there. So you got one full size board and two half size boards. This is the compact version, which is the upright version. The sit-down version, the cockpit, I believe has an even bigger board set. It's got, I think it's got a fourth board on it. I might be wrong about that, but I think that's right. Um, so there's a lot going on on this thing, folks. Very complex. Um, but everything's in nice shape. It's in original condition. Everything's working except for those two issues that I mentioned. So uh, let me plug it in, and we'll see what happens when it comes up. And then we're going to mess with that brake, and we're going to mess with that uh, steering thing to see if I can figure out what's going on with that. Okay, so we, like I said, we've been working on it, so I plugged it in. It came right up like it should. Uh, but we're going to go into the test mode and mess with it a little bit. And again, we're looking at a mirror. See the line of the mirror? We're looking at the monitor, which is actually up there. Right? Let me see if I can get into test mode here. And we're going to mess with a couple things. If I can reach it. Alright, so we're in self-test. It's testing, but remember it said something about it's going to take it five minutes. Program RAM, okay. Here we go.
you see the burn in on the screen. People get real weird about burn in. Even if you put a brand new tube in it with no burn in, guess what? It's going to get burn in on it as soon as you start playing it. So, burn in is a medal of honor, people. GSP VRAM, okay, simple test. GSP Color RAM, test in progress. It's testing our RAM, people. Okay. GSP Color RAM was okay. MSP Verify, 20 seconds. MSP DRAM OK. ADSP test, 35 seconds to 3 minutes. Uh huh, this is the one that's going to take a while. But this ADSP, I think, has something to do with the controls. So we need to do this one to make sure that the brake and the steering seem to be doing what it wants to do. <laughs> These came with the this thing came with the man. Whoa, 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 what? Huh? Who? Where? Why? When? Freaking Atari, man. Okay, the ADSP board is okay, and the soundboard test is okay. Turn key to select sound wave ROMs are okay too. Turn key to select the test menu. Believe it will. Using the test menu, press the left coin switch to move down or to increment. Press the right coin switch to move up or to decrement. Turn key to choose item or to return. Test menu. Operator screens, set controls, control inputs, Monitor test patterns, set time, disable broken controls, and special functions. Don't worry, we'll, we'll end up at the special functions eventually. <laughs> but let me see, for now, we're going to get down to set controls. I'm going to show you the, the issue that we're having. Initialize pot inputs. Take your hands and feet off all controls. then turn the key. Initialize steering limits. Turn wheel clockwise four turns. Turn key to abort. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So see, that's my, that's my issue. It's not reading that I'm turning it. So as it goes across the top, it should say turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four, but it did not. Turn key to abort. So we're moving through that. Initialize force break. Old maximum was 183, the range was 21. Take your foot off the brake, turn key to abort. Brake value two. Brake value is out of range. Wait 10 minutes with power on and try again. Turn key to continue. Now earlier the brake value said 255. So uh, we got some issues. I'm going to try to press the brake and see what happens. The brake does push down, but nothing, nothing happens. Okay, so we gotta wait 10 minutes. So why would we have to wait 10 minutes and try again? It's because this brake has a special little thing called a strain gauge on it. It's like, uh, it's basically a, a little, it's, it's uh, a trace that's taped to the, to the actual uh, brake uh, pedal, like the, po the, the post that holds up the brake pedal. And as you press on the, on the brake pedal, it bends that just ever so slightly and as it bends it slightly it changes the resistance of the strain gauge and uh, the board can read it so it's basically it can tell that you're pushing down on the brake by how much the 
the metal is is flexing, right? And the reason that they did it like that, so complex like that, is because it gave them a really realistic feel of a brake pedal. It made it just like a car, or feel like a car. And the brakes work really good on the game. Uh, well, not on this one, but <laughs> the brakes work really good whenever it works. So uh, that's something we're going to have to mess with a little bit. It could be a wire's broken. That's really common on these. Uh, so we'll, we'll be looking at it here in a minute. But we're going to wait 10 minutes and try it again first. But So that's that. All right, so let's go down to special functions and see what that is. Control inputs. Oh, let me go back to control inputs just so you can see. Okay, see the brake, how it's tripping. So it says FF. So when I hit that brake pedal, it's not doing nothing. All right, but we also have a clutch. See the clutch is at 12. Goes up to 2A. All right, pretty good. Gas pedal above it is at 5. pretty good on that shifter we replaced all the switches on the shifter so it's shifting pretty good now pretty smooth everything's cool all right so you just saw that the steering wheel wasn't working right right it's working fine but see where it says center edge that's what that other thing was trying to figure out so if I turn to the right we get that turn to the left we get that so there's something going on where the center edge is messed up which I guess is probably how the thing tells when it's centered so I think that might be our problem um, so that's what we're looking at all right so now we're gonna go down to special functions Let's see what the hell that is <laughs> Special functions. Oh, what a letdown. We've already done all of that. What a letdown. All right, so main board GSP test, main board MSP test, main board controls, main board ROM checksums, main board ZRAM tests, ADSP board tests, sound board tests. But let's do the controls. Steering wheel. Send force. Oh, press to increase positive force. All right, so see, we turned up the positive force, and now when I turn the key, let's see if we can get it up more. Oh, it would be force fighting me. So let's see if we can hold the steering wheel. I don't know that there's any force on it like that. Let's try to add a little more. Oh yeah. So that is spinning the wheel. Which if I was holding it, it would be fighting me. And you can see the Opto is figuring out where we're at, but the center edge is never coming on. So we got to figure out that center edge thing, and we got to figure out the brake thing. To exit, press increase and decrease at the same time. They're wanting me to press both uh, <laughs> both coin switches at the same time. All right, has it been ten minutes yet? Where I can check my, I can check my brake. Set to controls. All right, put that in the middle. Then turn key. I've already figured out we can't do that one. Brake value is now 24. 
break value out of range. Wait 10 minutes with power on and then try it again. Turn the key to continue. All right, so you saw it was at two earlier, now it's at 24. There's something about the thing has to heat up or something. So we'll leave it on for a little bit and then we'll try it again. But uh, first we're gonna mess with the steering thing and see if we can figure out what that center edge thing is that they're talking about. Okay, so I'm looking in the manual and this is the back side of the steering that we were just looking at. Remember, we couldn't see much because that's how we were looking at it. But if we were to look at the front side of the steering, over here on this side there is an encoder disc, right? So there's a little wheel that spins around and this little board up here can read what position the steering wheel is in. But all I can really read is it going left or it going right, which it's doing because you can steer, everything works fine. But the centering thing is over here. Now remember, we were looking at the back. So if you think about it, you twist it around, right? <laughs> the, uh, this little thing here is called the centering disc PCB assembly. So that's another little optic. So what there must be is this centering disc collar and then the centering disc, right? There must be a hole in that disc, and as it spins around, when the hole goes through this little optic, it goes, hey, that's the center. So that must not be working right. So either it's unplugged, or it probably more likely is that there's dust and dirt on the optic, and so it can't see it. So we're gonna check that out and see if that, uh, we'll see what that looks like. So we're looking at the back of it again, and here's the part from the drawing. There is the little board they're talking about. If you look, that little wheel goes right through that optic. And if you look, see how the disc has a little hole in it? That's so that when that goes by, that little optic can see it. So that little optic is not seeing it. So that's what we need to figure out. So this is that little sensor board, and if you look, there's quite a bit of dust on it. So we're just going to clean off the dust and hopefully that'll fix it. Are there any, might be a bad solder joint or something, but it looks pretty good. So usually, now I might be jinxing myself here. I'm, I'm going to try not to jinx myself. But usually, people, whenever they have a problem with something like this, they'll go, oh, that sensor's bad. Clean it first. But, you know, it could be bad. But I'm going to go with it's not bad. It's fine. It's just dirty. So we'll see. We'll see how good my luck is. <laughs> I put myself out there. Now i got to back it up. All right, so I'm going to try cleaning it. Literally, I'm just going to spray some Windex on a paper towel and run it through there and just clean it off, get it nice and shiny again, and then we'll mount it back in the game. Okay, so I have reinstalled that little sensor. Let's test it out here. Let's test it. Initialize pot inputs. Take your hands and feet off all controls, then turn the key. All right, so I got it centered. Turn the key. Initialize steering limits, turn wheel clockwise, four turns, turn key to abort. So again, we're trying to get that, uh, it to tell whenever it goes by one turn, you know. Oh, snap. Two, three. <laughs> now center the wheel, okay, then turn the key. Oh, look, it changed it just slightly. <laughs> oh, but the brake, the brake, ah! Brake value 255. Brake value out of range. Wait 10 minutes, so we left it on all that time. So that brake value is tripping on us. Wait 10 minutes with power on and try again. So that's not fixing that. So we need to look at the brake. I think we're actually going to have to take the brake uh, pedal out and just check out that 
strain gauge. So you're going to get to see it. What do you think about that? Okay, so, uh, yeah. All right, so uh, we'll start. Uh, I'll see if, let's look in the manual what, what the brake thing is so we can look at it, know what we're looking at. All right, so here is the brake pedal and the gas pedal. There's also a clutch, but it's on a separate little assembly. All right. So here's our brake pedal. See how it says brake pedal replacement kit? The reason they said that is because they thought that the strain gauge would mess up after a while. Well, guess what? After a while has came. So that, you can see on the back of it, there's a little shaft. It goes through. There is a big rubber bumper under it. And that's what gives you the resistance when you push on it. You're basically bending this metal bar over that rubber uh, bumper a little bit. And as it flexes just a little bit, it flexes that strain gauge, which they have designated as a little square thing on top of it. And then it's held in place in the back by a screw and some stuff. So that strain gauge, we have to get in there and check that out. So I'm going to take this assembly out of the front of it and see what's going on. Um, there's a little flow chart here too. Okay. Brake pedal is not working. Okay. You have tried the set control screen. Go to the control input screen in the self-test. Remember we did that. Does the brake force line change when you operate the control? No. Has the game been powered on at least 10 minutes? Yes. When I was a kid, I used to read these uh, Encyclopedia Brown books. Anybody remember that? Did I still make those? Encyclopedia Brown, when I was in the second grade. You would read these books. <laughs> Slide aside here. You would read these books, and it, would, it was like he was a detective. Right? He was a kid, but he was a detective. And so you would read the books, and at the end, it would ask you, you know, basically you'd have to decide one way or the other. And if you decided one way, it would say, turn to page 83. And if you decided the other way, it would say, turn to page 91. And so then you would, cha you would, you would uh, uh, turn the page, and there would be more of the story. And then at the bottom, it would tell you to check pages again. A little flashback. Does the brake force line change when you operate the control? No. Has the game been powered on at least 10 minutes? Uh, yes. Does the brake LED on the main PCB dim when the brake is pressed hard? I have no way of knowing that because I can't press the brake hard and look at the back of the PCB easily. So I'm going to say, if I say no, it says that there is a F4 fuse. Hmm. Hmm. If yes, check the connectors and wiring from the brake pedal to the main PCB. Check the strain gauge and the strain gauge bonding. Replace the fuse. Does the brake LED, blah, blah, blah. Troubleshoot the 8-bit AD circuit on the main PCB. So see, we don't want that to be the end of the, the Encyclopedia Brown story. So we're not going to do that. We're going to do it this way. No, that light doesn't come on. So now we're going to check the fuse. And uh, it's either a bad fuse or you need to check the connectors and wiring from the brake pedal to the main PCB, check the strain gauge and the strain gauge bonding. In other words, the glue. Okay, so I'm going to check that fuse and then I'm going to pull out the, the whenever it's fine, I'm going to pull out the uh, pedal. Okay, I pulled it out of the game. And as you can see, it's covered in dust. So I'm going to get a vacuum cleaner and get all that off of there. You see, there's a little bit of wobble in the in the in the uh, brake pedal and the, the strain gauge is underneath all that dust right there. So I'm going to uh, I'm gonna vacuum it off, clean it off a little bit and then we'll see what it looks like under underneath it all. Okay, got rid of the dust. Check this out. So basically the strain gauge is like a flat thing that is glued to the shaft of the brake pedal. And the whole problem is someone has glued it back on with just some like hot glue and it won't work like that because the thing moves like it, it has to be able to it has to be able to 
be perfectly flat on that on that uh, pedal. So I don't know. It could just be that since there's play in the back of it because that screw's loose. Um, but here's the deal. Let me show you what I found in the manual. I always read the manual, people. Okay. Testing the brake pedal strain gauge and bonding. Have I mentioned to you before that Atari made excellent manuals? I mean, they really, come on. Hey, Rob, let me prove it. <laughs> so with the game, they gave you this. Schematic package, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. It's the complete schematics of everything in the freaking game. All of those boards that we're looking at. It's got it all, man. It's got it all. So Atari always had really nice manuals. It's a damn shame they went out of business. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things they were telling us in their really nice manual back in then, testing the brake pedal strain gauge and bonding. If you have brake problems, we do. See the flow chart in figure 3-5. We did. If necessary, do the following tests to check the strain gauge and strain gauge bonding. Put an ohm meter across pins 1 and 2 of the brake harness connector. If the ohm meter does not measure 350 ohms plus or minus 10%, so it could be 385 or it could be 315, the strain gauge is bad or the connection is bad. Replace the brake pedal and the strain gauge. So I have connected an ohm meter. I haven't touched a thing. Connected the meter to the two wires. And we've got 349 ohms. So that means that our strain gauge is just fine. If ohm meter does not measure 350, the strain gauge is bad or the connection is bad, replace the brake pedal and the strain gauge. If the ohm meter does measure 350, plus or minus 10%, Then check the bonding. Attach a digital volt ohm meter to pins one and two and have someone press hard on the brake. Okay, probably should have done that when I was in the cabinet. <laughs> you can't get to the back of it though, that's the whole problem. Use a sensitive ohm meter to check the change in resistance since the change is only about one ohm. So when I get on that damn thing, it ought to drop the, it ought to change one ohm. If the resistance does not change as the pressure on the brake pedal changes, then the bonding has failed and you must replace the brake pedal and the strain gauge. Replacing the brake strain gauge. If you have tested the strain gauge and are sure that the gauge or the bonding is bad, you must replace the brake pedal with the strain gauge already attached since special bonding techniques are required. Follow the steps in replacing the brake pedal. So basically what they're telling you is that you got to get that glued on there just right. And somebody's glued it on with hot glue, which I don't really blame them, but I don't think that's going to work. But maybe it could just be that the screw's loose, so we're going to try it. So I'm going to uh, tighten up the screw, and then I'm going to uh, press down on that thing as hard as I can and see if I can get that to say 8. <laughs> I tightened up the bolt. Here we go. <laughs> My arms are like legs. Okay, so you saw what I was doing. Basically, the strain gauge is working fine. And remember it said to look and see if the red light is on on the board when you press the pedal, right? Okay, so I, uh, I put it back, I put the pedal back in 
and I had left the machine on the entire time. So I went right back into the test and it uh, was still telling me that the value was 255. Okay, now remember when we started it, the value was 1. And then uh, we checked it again and it was 10. And then we checked it again and it was higher and it kept getting higher, right? So it's going up as time goes on. All right. So, oh, okay, so I put it in, it was 255. So I unplugged the harness. There's two little wires. Strain gauge. I unplugged the wires from the board and uh, there was a red light that went out. I plugged them back in, the red light came back on. Right? So I unplugged the two wires and checked resistance and I was still getting 349 ohms even all the way through the uh, all the way through the cable like all the wires and everything so the strain gauge seems to be working fine it's a board thing which is like oh no oh no not a board thing but you can't think like that people you have to think well if it's a board thing I can fix it okay so let's try to fix it this is where it plugs in. It is pins 8 and 9 on J8. I've got grease all over my hands. I've been working on my truck. J8 pins 8 and 9. That's where it plugs in. Okay. I turned the machine off. Waited a minute. Turned it back on. The red light was not on. I went back into the, t the test. The, the controls test. And it was back to saying that the number was 1 instead of 255. So what does that sound like to you? So it changes after it's been on a while. It's already telling you that uh, check back in 10 minutes, things like that. So it's heat related, right? It has to heat up. Well, why would it have to heat up? Because it's something to do with capacitors, right? All right, so it plugs in pin 8 and 9, strain gauge. So if we flip through here, Somewhere in here. This is, they're all stapled together weird, so I'd have to unstaple them to figure out what's what, but this is where all the inputs go in, right? J88. They are labeling as strain gauge B in. Notice there is also a strain gauge dot switch. That's because I think on the cockpit it uses a, a switch. It doesn't use the strain gauge. <laughs> or maybe it uses both. I don't know. But ours is number is pin number 8. Strain gauge B input. Now, the other one was, so that's J88. The other one was J89, which is just connected to ground on the board. So those two wires plug in, one of the wires connects to ground on the board. Bam, just like that. The other wire connects here, and they call that strain gauge B input. So we'll look through our handy Atari schematics. See what we can find. There might be something in here somewhere. What could we be looking for? Bam! Look at this. They have a special little circuit drawn up. Strain gauge B input comes in here. And so on one side it connects to 10 volts. The 10 volts is created by taking the 12 volts and a 10 volt uh, Zener diode and a capacitor hmm, huh, to create 10 volts. Now see the little capacitor that says 0.1 and there's just two lines? That's going to be a ceramic capacitor. Those usually don't go bad. They will one of these days, but we'll all be gone by then. <laughs> it's not a rule, but it's in general. They usually don't go bad. The resistor, eh, it might, but usually not. 
it's a little 82 ohm resistor and it's not labeled as like a high wattage resistor so it means it's a quarter watt which means that it's probably they're not worried about it burning up so we need to have 10 volts there right but look at this capacitor see how it has a plus and a minus that means it's an electrolytic capacitor and they dry out over time now remember it's saying that one ohm difference turns the pedal on and off so if anything changes much you got problems right so we're going to look at that capacitor but even more importantly da -da 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 -da. so here's the input it's tied to 10 volt through a resistor and then here is a capacitor tying it to ground a ceramic capacitor here's two more resistors here's another resistor and then it runs into this AD711 thing up here are a couple resistors here is another ceramic capacitor that diode there with the little lines on it I think that means that's an optic or something oh no that's the diode that I'm looking at that's the one that tur that's turning on and off so that's an LED and here's a resistor but I've carefully cropped this to not show you this three more resistors and then what in my what does that say that says C368 10 20 V T now T stands for tantalum I'll bet and tantalums are known for screwing up so here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna pull the board out and I'm gonna replace that capacitor I don't have a tantalum though so I'm gonna put an electrolytic which since there since it needs to be pretty precise it would be better if you had a tantalum but I don't so I'm gonna just put an electrolytic in it and I'm gonna replace this one with an electrolytic and then we're gonna try it again and uh, see if it wants to act right here she is isn't she beautiful okay everything looks so so fresh and so clean here are the two caps so this 366 is the one that's used to make 10 volt and this is the one that I think may be a tantalum because it's marked as T it doesn't necessarily look like a tantalum but uh, but there it is hmm okay so I'm gonna I'm gonna swap it and we'll pull it out and see what it looks like and we'll replace this one while we're at it and uh, we'll see what this thing's labeled once I get it out and I can look at it a little bit better Alright folks, so the one that uh, was is marked as a tantalum, it, it appeared to me that the thing had been changed at some point. I couldn't tell for sure, but it kind of looked that way. So, this could be the replacement one, right? So I want to show you something. You just tell me your opinion. And again, I'm not sure that's a tantalum, and it's not. it doesn't measure shorted. But if you think about it, we weren't getting it where it was measured shorted. It changed over time. So, I don't know. I think it's just a worn out cap. I have to pardon all the truck grease on my fingers, but look. So this is what I want you to see. Well, damn, if I can get it turned around where you can read it. Oh, yeah. There you go. Alright, so look close. 10 microfarad, 20 volt, 10%. So it's not too damn exact, you know. It could be 10% off. And then look at that. Is that a date code? Does that say 1984, 39, week 39? I believe it does. I'd bet money that's a 1984, week 39 cap. So they took, this is an 89 board set. Um, with presumably parts from 1989. I don't know if we've got anything where we can tell. Let's see if I can see an obvious date code on anything. Uh... Yeah, okay. See the left transistor there? It says 8905. That's the fifth week of 1989. See the one on the right? 
8822. That's the 22nd week of 1988. So whoever worked on this, it, it appears to me, took the cap off because it was a problem. Probably way back in the day. The only reason I could tell the solder looked the same, but there was a. It looked like there was a couple little flakes of solder around it. So whenever you, whenever you resolder one, there's always a little trash. You know, if it's not perfectly clean, and mine never are. So yeah. So see, see like to the right of that, you see just a little flake of solder there. So you can kind of tell that it's been changed. Well, eventually this this solder will age, and it'll look the same as the rest of it. Well, that's how these two looked, but there was a little couple little flakes of solder around both of the pins. So it looked to me like it had been changed at some point. So some, op some operator took out the original capacitor and replaced it with a capacitor that was five years older. So it was probably just a, a uh, you know, something that he had laying around or a new old stock. And there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes things wear out. So again, I'm not criticizing the operator or anything, but I'm just saying what that's making me believe is that that cap probably goes bad a lot. What do you think? Is that solid logic? I think that's solid logic. So, again, I don't want to jinx myself like I did last time. But, <laughs> I think this might fix it. We're going to go pop it back in the game and see what we got, people. Okay, so it's starting at zero. It's saying break value out of range. Wait 10 minutes with power on and try again. Turn key to continue. So starting at zero. And this is the LED that eventually comes on whenever it's saying 255. So we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll leave it on for about 10 minutes and then we'll try it again and see if the number changed. Okay folks, it's been about 20 minutes and that LED has not came on. So I don't know. So I don't know if we fixed it, but we're about to find out. Actually, I, I think you can fall off the loop. Am I right about that? Or am I thinking about, I think I'm thinking about San Francisco Rush. Or Rush 2049, something like that. Okay, okay, so let's go into the test mode. We're going to see if our brake is fixed. If I can find the test switch. It's one thing about it being dark. <laughs> Hold key to bypass. Alright, alright. Set controls. Take your hands and feet off all controls, then turn the key. Turn wheel clockwise four turns or turn key to abort. Well, we already did that, so I'm just going to abort it. So here it is, people. Keep your fingers crossed. If that damn thing says zero or 255, it's still broke. Oh! I wonder if, though, since it's a zero, if I can press the... The range was 21 before, so it should have been... it. So I should be getting something like 162, but I'm not. Hmm... Let me try just pressing it and see what happens. Nope. I got nothing. Let's go to the test thing again. Brake force zero. Well, I think we stopped it from uh, <laughs> from rising to 255, but now we can't get it to go off zero. What the hell? Maybe I uh, don't have something plugged in. What about that? nothing. I guess it could be that that um, AD whatever chip. Hmm. 
we'll have to test some more stuff, folks. Okay, folks, so if you think about it, the capacitor, whenever I changed it, it stopped going from 1 all the way up to 255 as it heated up. Now it just stays at 0. It did go up to 1 earlier, but it won't go above 1. So the capacitor that I changed was on the left side of the that... Uh, I guess I should look up what that thing is. The little 8-pin chip there. So the input's over here, the output's over here. So the input had this cap on it and uh, the output ended up rising. Well, all we did was change the cap and the output isn't rising anymore. But we put the wrong cap in. Remember, I put an electrolytic. Now on the 10 volt thing, 12 volt and the 10 volt, I've tested that. I'm getting my 12 volt and my 10 volt on the board, but the thing will not go above uh, zero. The capacitor's in there fine. I tested all the resistors around there. I don't believe it's that chip though, because that chip with the, with the uh, with the the tantalum capacitor was having it it was working it was just working too good it was going from zero and then going up to two fifty five and sticking so here's what I'm thinking I think I need to order a tantalum cap capacitor to put it right in there you know to replace it with the correct part you know they do have a difference they there there are certain places where it's necessary and you know think about it they used an electrolytic capacitor right there and they used all of those ceramic capacitors right there and on some of the other boards they've got radial electrolytic capacitors but for whatever reason in this circuit they're using a tantalum capacitor and it's it's marked on the schematics so I don't completely understand why but I'm not a uh, an engineer you know I don't know how that works so I'm just gonna order the exact same freaking cap that was in there so it's even the same company Right. Hopefully this one will be newer than 1984, though. 10 microfarad. That's a you know, stock picture, but 10 microfarad, 20 volt. That's exactly what they had in there. Um, it's all ordered at. We'll pop it in and see if that fixes it. All right, folks. We have fixed it. Show them, Joe. See where it says brake force? It's just barely moving, but that's how it's made. It's See if you can really get on it, Joe. <laughs> if he really gets on it. So if you do an emergency brake slam. So what we did was we swapped that cap. And for whatever reason, yeah, it needs a tantalum. So 10 microfarad, 20 volt. Now this red light stays on. Hit the brakes, Joe. So that red light is on a little bit, but not as bright as the other ones. So... I don't know. You can figure it out on yours, but it, it allowed us to do the thing. Basically, after it was on 10 minutes, the number came up to number 83. I would go back in and do it again and show you, but I don't want to... Uh, <laughs> we got it working. I don't want to keep trying to redo it and everything. So we're going to put it back in the game. And Joe's going to play it for us. Show us how it's done. He's an expert. <laughs> gonna do automatic just because it's easier but you can't really you can't get as far with the automatic but he can show you the brakes working finally you can hear them because it'll squeal and stuff oh snap wow Joe you got the brakes working it's amazing so we couldn't see the replay. <laughs> that might have been one of the best wrecks I've ever seen on this game. So 
looked like I was in the air forever. Yeah, he was in the air for like 10, 10 seconds. You didn't wreck, so it won't do a replay. Somehow you slid uh, through an 18-wheeler. Hey, try the stunt track this time, Joe. All right, we know you all want it. All right. Do I? You didn't oh, start. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you just take it to the right and go to the stunt track. See that guy hitting his brakes so that you can't? He's trying to keep you off the stunt track, Joe. Going too fast. <laughs> Might be able to go around the barn. Okay, you fell off something. It says you're off road again. Okay, you about got it. All right, here we go. Fix that shit. <laughs> Gomer's uh, uh, gas station there. Really, once you get the hang of it, it's better to use the uh, uh oh, you're in trouble. You're going to fall off. Nah, you made it. You're going too fast. There's a setting where you can disable it, and it makes it where when you let off the gas, it, it puts on the brake. Oh, man, you almost made it. Oh, well, you tried. All right, there you go, folks. What do you think, Joe? Works great. Phantom Photon. Number two. Oh, you were number one. You were better than Mustang Sally and Leadfoot. And I can't drive 55. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> Too late. All right, so that's what I was saying. If you can't fix the brake, there's a thing in there you can set to disable it. And it, whenever you do that, whenever you let off the gas, it hits the brakes. But it's better if you get the... Uh, the original one working so we're very very happy that we got it up and running that's very cool so i hope you enjoyed it leave your comments below let us know what you think about it hard driving this is the compact version that's smaller than the sit down hey joe i've told him the story before tell him the story about the sit down uh hard driving that we got back in the day it was huge <laughs> it took four of us to get it in the house so it was me and joe and my brother donnie and we couldn't get it in the house. So we had to ask a girl to help us. There were steps. There <laughs> it were was that steps. bad. There was one little step and then another little step up into the doorway. Three guys couldn't get it in without a chick's assistance. That's how bad it was. She had to hold the door open. <laughs> so we got it in the living room and it sat over in the corner. We got it all working, didn't we? Yeah. We had it all working and everything. So we, uh, we had it in our living room for a while. That was a long time ago. We sold it, and we haven't had a sit-down cockpit version since, so they're a little harder to find that are still working. A lot of times, these big games like this, the operators literally threw them in the trash. 
Because once they stopped making as much money and they weren't selling for much at the auctions, they'd just trash them. If the thing was broke and they didn't want to spend the money to fix it or even take the time to mess with it, and it was big, a lot of them got trashed. So that's why you don't see a lot of the, the games you remember from back in the day that were big, huge ones. So, All right, so man, I'm happy we got this thing fixed. So leave your comments below. That's how you fix the steering, and that's how you fix the brake. And uh, let us know what you think. Make sure to give us a thumbs up. There is a link down below to our Amazon page. All you got to do is click that link before you go to Amazon and whatever you buy while you're on Amazon. So let's say you want to go get some socks. Well, if you click that link, it will uh, give us a little piece of your, uh, your sock purchase. And Amazon uh, pays out a little royalty to everybody that sends people to Amazon, which is what that link does. So you don't have to sign up for nothing or anything. You just click it. So we appreciate everybody that's been doing that. And also, uh, uh, make sure to check out our brother's channel, my brother Donnie. He's always got all kinds of crazy stuff on there that he's doing, working on vehicles, working on old buildings, things like that. And uh, he appreciates the support, too. So leave your comments below, give us a thumbs up, and we'll see you on the next video. Hard driving. All right, folks, you all hear that? There used to be this guy that came in our shop at night. And he'd always want to play the games. And so we'd, uh, we'd let him hang out sometimes if we were here late. And his favorite was all the driving games, right? So anyway, the guy disappeared... You hear that? The guy disappears and he stops coming in, right? We haven't seen him for a while. So one day his wife comes by and she lets us know that he passed away, right? His name was George. So anyway, ever since that happened, we keep... You hear that? We keep getting this weird thing where every time we get a driving game in, Did you see that?